So, with Rule 39, an unnamed, anonymous judge, we now know not a Russian, but at one point rumoured to be a Russian, um, was awoken or disturbed from an evening out and said, you can't send aeroplanes to Rwanda, even though the British High Court had said that you can, on condition that if we find against you, you would then bring them back. Was that a reasonable thing to do, and could the government just have overruled it? Well, you actually understate the position, because it's not just the British High Court we should refuse to give an injunction. That had been upheld in the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. So the British government had actually won three times. Um, the European Court of Human Rights, an unnamed judge, then gave, as you say, a Rule 39 uh, injunction, effectively. Um, and the real question is, do we have to abide by them? When we signed up to the European Convention of Human Rights, we signed up to a number of obligations. One of those obligations is that we have to enforce and abide by final rulings or final judgments given by the court against the UK. Clearly an interim injunction such as this isn't a final uh, judgment. More than that, when the convention was being drafted in the late 40s, one of the drafts of the convention gave the court the power to give these interim injunctions that didn't find its way into the final version of the convention. So there is no basis in the convention itself for this power. And as I and others have argued, the court cannot arrogate to itself a jurisdiction which it wasn't given by the member states. But it has, and we followed it, even though some other countries don't. So if you had been Attorney General at the time, would you have advised the government simply to proceed and send those planes to Rwanda? Well, we, we can follow injunctions on the basis that the court has jurisdiction to give them, or we could actually follow them while reserving our position on the jurisdictional issue. So there are two issues, aren't there? There's a legal issue and a political issue. Whether one actually wants to follow the injunction raises both of those issues. Uh, if I'd have been Attorney General, the one thing I would have done was to put down a clear marker that although the practice of this country has been, in fact, to abide by Rule 39, uh, injunctions. That's not because we have a treaty obligation to do so. We don't. And the political argument then becomes paramount. Yes. Um, you're a politician as well as a lawyer. As a politician, do you think the government would have been wise, with all the pressure that there was a year ago on the small boats coming over, um, the expectation, as has turned out to be the case, that it would continue politically to say, actually, we don't accept this. Our own courts have judged that it's fair. We will, of course, abide by a final decision whilst we're within the treaty. But in the meantime, the planes are going off. I'm not sure politically, really, whether it would have made that much of a difference in the long run, because we have the Rwanda policy wending its way through our courts at the moment. The government succeeded at first instance before the divisional court, as you know. That's now going on uh, appeal. I'm not sure at the end of the day it would have made a difference to the policy. We would still be tied up in the legal arguments which we are now currently engaged in. The critical thing is that nobody should be able to think that we regard ourselves as having an obligation to abide by Rule 39 orders. And you have hot-footed it today from the House of Lords, which is debating this very subject. The House of Lords is very against the power being reserved to the Home Secretary or the Secretary of State, technically, uh, to override Rule 39 orders. Um, how are you going to persuade the House of Lords not to obstruct the government in this co confirmatory piece of legislation? Well. Uh, one hopes the House of Lords will always listen to reasoned argument, and I and others uh, are trying to set out the arguments... Is that the triumph of hope over experience? Well, I, I did win some debates when I was a minister, uh, although I lost a number as well. So pe the, the debate, the quality of debate in the House of Lords actually is very good. Uh, I think you're right. The weight of the numbers in the Lords at the moment are certainly against various provisions in the bill. However, the House of Lords has a strong history of recognising that ultimately it is a... Uh, has to play second fiddle to the elected chamber. And I think that's part of our constitutional settlement. The House of Lords is a revising chamber. It can ask the Commons to think again. I'm sure it will ask the Commons to think again. But if the Commons, having thought again, says actually this is what we want to do, I would hope that at some point the House of Lords recognises that there are some battles it shouldn't win. But do you think the Rule 39 order is symptomatic of how the ECHR is trying to take more powers to itself and is at the heart of the discontent within the UK where we've got a very well-established legal system, we have the rule of law, uh, the discontent that we feel with membership of the Convention and abiding by the court and that if the court doesn't work this out, 
actually in a few years' time, the UK will leave the auspices of the Convention? Well, law has a zeitgeist. Law ebbs and flows. And the interesting thing is that there were a number of decisions of the European Court of Human Rights which held that it did not have the power to give these orders. Then it changed tack and held that it did have the power. Uh, the British government is now engaged with the Strasbourg Court in a very meaningful way. Robert Jenrick has given a number of interviews on this. And I would expect that the Strasbourg Court will not want to take on, so to speak, one of the main member states on an issue like this. The Strasbourg Court has, to be fair to it, moved in the last few years to a position of subsidiarity, I recognising that member states ought to have a greater freedom to adopt policies which are suitable for their own, uh, for their own societies. And I suspect that's where we will end up on this issue. And the Court is much more political than you might expect a court to be. Actually, in a way, all courts are. They're part of the uh, political nation, or in this case, the political international settlement. And if you look at the ruling uh, on prisoner voting rights, which the UK refused to implement and refused to implement, eventually the court accepted and the um, council accepted a compromise that basically meant almost nobody got voting rights who was in prison. And, of course, we accepted the compromise as well. Oh, absolutely, I mean, yes. that was a very, it's a very good example, actually, of where there's a bit of a standoff. But I think both sides, if I can put it that way, recognise that really there has to be a solution. Uh, the court won't want the UK to leave. Uh, I think for us to leave the European Convention of Human Rights would be a retrograde step. Uh, I find it difficult to believe, really, that we can't run our society and stay a member of the Convention. Uh, and, therefore, at the end of the day... I think a solution will be found. Do you fundamentally believe that human rights in this country need to be protected by an international convention or are best protected by domestic elections? Well, I think there are certain things where the issue is best settled by a democratic vote. Uh, and you could make a case, for example, I think Lord Sumption makes this case. Uh, why do we not have a big political issue in this, case, in this country on abortion? whereas they do, for example, in the States. And Lord, Lord Sumption's approach is to say, well, in the States it's a judicial decision at the end of the day. People feel therefore disenfranchised. In our country it's a free vote in the House of Commons. So some things I think are best left to, the, uh, to Parliament uh, rather than to courts. And assisted dying is another example, I think. But if life isn't a fundamental right established by the courts but is best set by democracy, what is a fundamental right? Well, it is an oddity. I mean, this is a big philosophical issue. It is, it is something of an oddity that, for example, under the Convention, the right to life is a qualified right, i.e. there are circumstances in which one can take away life. Uh, torture is unqualified, uh, even if it doesn't lead to death. So one can have a very interesting philosophical debate on points like this. I mean, I, I think we come from a strong common law tradition. I'm a huge fan of the common law. The common law is a system of law which suits us in these islands and has stood the test of time. It is fair to say, however, that there are some uh, rights which we now recognise as important, which actually did come from the Strasbourg jurisprudence. Uh, so, left to ourselves, perhaps we wouldn't have got there or wouldn't have got there as quickly. W what I really want to see is to make sure that we can graft on the Convention jurisprudence onto our common law.